you to uh, start thinking of your questions and if you have questions just raise your hands up nice and high we'll do our best to get to as many of you as possible uh, but in order to get that conversation going I'm gonna invite back onto the stage a very talented filmmaker ladies and gentlemen Matt Wolf. Um, and so Matt like before I open up to uh, the floor I'm just kind of curious if you can talk a bit about kind of the genesis of this project for you specifically how did you hear about Marion Stokes and how then that became the film that we saw today before I do that I want to recognize Owen Pallett the composer who's here who did an amazing job um, I when um, the Internet Archive acquired Marion's collection um, there was an initial wave of press and I saw a blog post um, about it so through some kind of detective work I found, Michael, her son, and my producer Kyle and I went down there and um, we arrived at the Barclay, which was a very fancy apartment building. That's not what we were expecting. And when we went inside, um, we opened the door and there were hundreds of Macintosh computers in their original boxing being liquidated. And that was a surprise. And then um, we went across the street to the cafe where Marion would have that martini every day. And Michael and her secretary, Frank, were crying. And we realized, you know, this isn't just an interesting archival collection. This is a really intense family story. Mm -hmm. and and before I open up to the floor, uh, one of the things that was so remarkable when I first saw this film is this film in these 90 odd minutes is a feat of editing. You had so much work uh, to look through. And I'm just kind of curious about like that process of like, how are you like going through those tapes? Who are you working with? And how do we condense, condense, condense it down to uh, this film? Um, I'll try to make this short. It was a long process, but um, we actually had to index Marion's entire collection of 70,000 tapes. So in a grassroots process, um, which we kind of imagined ourselves, we created a conveyor belt system at the Internet Archive with a camera mounted on top. And Marion kept her tapes spine up in these cardboard file boxes, um, and she wrote what we call metadata on the spines of the tapes, um, the day, the date, the network and um, the, the hours of recording, and we took photos of all of those. Um, we put out a call for volunteers because we knew we needed to transcribe that information, and miraculously, over 50 people from around the world agreed to help us transcribe that material. And so through Dropbox images and a Google spreadsheet, people started contributing. And, and one volunteer rose to the occasion and became our main archivist and completed this index. So. I went through Wikipedia every year is summarized in Wikipedia and it has kind of big ticket historical events like the fall of the Berlin Wall, but it also has things like the collapse of the Miss America stage. So I made a big wish list of all sorts of dates and then Katrina, our archivist, would go through the database. Then someone at the Internet Archive would get a forklift, pull down a, a pallet, go in a box and get the tape and then it would get digitized. Then. I would scrub through the tapes 10 times speed, marking things that were interesting. And honestly, what was interesting wasn't what we were looking for. It was other stuff. And that's when the creative process began. Yeah, well, all right. Well, I'm going to move it to the floor for questions on, on that note. Uh, so if you have questions, I, like I said, I encourage you. Oh, uh, we got a hand right there. Uh, the, the question is how far in terms of digitizing uh, the archive is it's it? just beginning um, it's really it's going to cost two million dollars for them to digitize the entire collection <laughs> um, that seems within scope to them in terms I mean they're a huge organization that's archiving the entire internet you may have used the Wayback machine so they do enormous projects like this but it's it's beginning it's not where they're not far into that process yeah that's fair uh -huh. moving back to the floor I know it's Bit of a late day, but oh, oh, right. You mentioned uh, in the intro that it took you five years to make this film, and uh, how long was the production and then the editing? It was a lot of stopping and starting. Um, for instance, indexing the entire collection took a long time, but um, it, you know, eh, I forgot. Um, it, it was staggered over the course of five years. It wasn't a constant flow of work. So when I started this film, it was before um, so-called fake news was part of the discourse. So the film took on a different kind of significance over time. 
Was there something that surprised you about this process in, in terms of like these five years that you were working away? Uh, like there's something that you thought maybe a, here's what I know what's going on and then took left to center? I, I think I always felt like it was not going to be possible for a viewer to sustain a film that really explored the depths of her archive and the family story. I thought it would be too dense. I didn't think I'd be able to interweave the two things. And I felt like I feel like I did. And um, the question I always was asking myself is how does Marion point to the archive and how does the archive point back to Marion? And having a lot of stops and starts in this edits and coming back to this project with fresh eyes helped me to achieve that balance. Yeah, that's nice. Okay, uh, uh, we got a couple of questions, so we're gonna go right there. I think in the black and then right behind you. So how did Michael and the other folks contribute to making the film? Yeah, obviously Michael is the center of the film. The film is about his relationship with his mother, but of course, Marion consciously created a kind of surrogate family of these assistants. So their relationship to her was equally intense. And I think a film like this is inevitably speculative. Marion isn't someone who necessarily wanted to be known, but she did something of historical significance. And those who knew her best felt that it was fair and felt compelled to tell her story. So this is a mystery. Um, but those who knew Marion are, are what we, they are how we are able to access her. She was a very inaccessible person. Mm -hmm. and, and yeah, the question right behind. The other question is about licensing. Did you have to pay for kind of this footage or these TV networks? Um, like 97% of the film is fair use. Um, and our fair use argument was enhanced by the fact that the film is about media criticism as well. Uh, yeah, right. Far back, and then we'll go right there. So yeah. Yeah, I mean, I the the question is, can the archive be used towards conservative political goals? Of course, I think um, you know the issue with YouTube and the way that we have access to archive media now is that it it's inherently out of context. Um, the resource that an archive like this provides is the context in the true sense, and um, yeah, every everything can be taken out of context and used towards ideological ends. But I think not even having the context is is the the genesis of that problem. Yeah, and uh, yeah, just up to the side. Yeah, so, I mean the sorry, go ahead. Yeah, so no, the question is just about the timeline and the stuff. Yeah, I mean the film we've we've done this film non-linearly, um, but um, the staff was involved in Marianne's life uh, towards the end of John Stokes's life, and then became central to her day-to-day -day life after he died. Is the family helping to pay for them? No, no. <laughs> so, well, we can likely fit in one she, more. It's not like she was super nice to everybody in the family, you know. <laughs> so we can likely fit in one more question. Yeah. Uh, so the question is, how do you decide on what point in history that you want to touch upon in this film? I mean, someone brought this up, an, an unconventional chronological timeline. I wanted to use the footage in a few different ways to t go deep into specific events like the Iranian hostage crisis, which is very relevant to Marianne's story, to 9-11, which is a collective experience we all had on television, and that's why I thought it was significant to show. And then I wanted to use TV in a way that was similar to video art in a kind of collage, and then these kind of capsules that show the passage of time, but I was most interested in the kind of detritus uh, material that's lost in, in what I call the trash can of history. Um, so, you know, I was less interested in the fall of the Berlin Wall and more interested in the collapse of the Miss America stage, which is this analogy I keep using, even though that clip's not in the film. <laughs> it's a, one of those things I wanted. But, uh, you know, so I decided things that I felt would resonate today from the past as a kind of way to reinforce that the past represents itself in compelling ways. As part of the, the whole argument of why this archive of, is of such value, we don't know um, what will be interesting in it into the future. Kellyanne Conway is not going to be interesting in 20 years. Somebody else will be. So that's that's part of the that's part of the premise of why this archive is interesting. Yeah, no, fair enough, fair enough. Um, we do have to wrap up, but before we do, I just want to say thank you so much for all of your questions and to Matt for bringing this film here. Uh, Thanks for staying late. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah.